Well, hello and welcome to this edition of EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor. I'm your host for episode 23, the last one. Well, before Christmas anyway, I might get another one in before the year is out. We'll see. Thank you very much for joining me. I don't have a big show today. I just want to go through a couple of stories and get this show out before Christmas and have an opportunity to wish everybody the best. But let me get to some stories that I've been covering for the past week. Now, this first one is just uh, information that I received uh, through an article about vulnerabilities in connected EV chargers. What that means is that if you have an electric vehicle home charger, that's one of the smart ones that has Wi-Fi access so that you can do things like program it and do automation and controls and get reports and things like that from it. Apparently, there are some vulnerabilities that could occur with these kind of units, and it's not uncommon with IoT kind of devices, uh, Internet of thing devi- Things devices like these, anything that's connected, that has an IP address that's connected to the Internet, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is, you know, certainly has a security vulnerability. Well, Kaspersky's labs experts have discovered that electric vehicle chargers supplied by many of the vendors carry vulnerabilities, which can be exploited by cyber attack attackers. And the consequences of a successful attack could include damage to the home electricity network. So they found a way that you could initiate commands on the charger to either stop the charging or set it to a maximum current possible. But certainly the second option of, uh, of being able to change the, the current um, of the charging could be some, somewhat uh, serious. It could potentially cause the wires to overheat on a device that's not protected by a trip fuse. Now, I know here in Ontario, when I had my wall charger installed, they did uh, send it, they did put a breaker box in the middle. So it actually had, there's a breaker box and a on and off switch before the fuse panel. So I'm not sure if that somebody who's an electrician out there could probably comment on my comments about if that's, you know, can negate this problem about setting the charger to a maximum current and then maybe overheating and whether or not it would actually um, be an issue. Um, if compromised the connected chargers, you know, could therefore cause a power overload and could take down a network and so forth and, and not really good stuff. So uh, what I would, what they're advising people to do is that just to make sure that you have passwords on your, anything that's connected, that you don't use the default passwords that come with the units um, because 94 percent of the attacks on iot devices in 2018 uh, came from telnet and ssh password brute force and in order to protect yourself so that you don't have any vulnerabilities uh, exploited make sure you update your device uh, your smart devices to the latest software versions because of course manufacturers are always enhancing and and adding protection to the devices through software updates Uh, do not as i mentioned use the default password for wi-fi routers and devices and then iso your smart home network from your network used by your smart devices or by your family's personal devices if you can for basic internet searching. So um, interesting that Kaspersky has actually come out with this article and if you want more information just uh, google them and check them out. However just a quick news about the Tesla Model 3. Um, There was an article that uh, came out that a Model 3 was spotted at a CCS charging uh, or it was charging via CCS at a FastNed station in, I believe, the Netherlands. Um, and it's uh, we've we've seen pictures, and we know that some of the Model 3s or the Model 3s coming to Europe are going to be equipped with CCS as well, which is great. It'll just add more uh, connectivity for your Model 3s and give you more charging options. Well, this uh, picture of this uh, Model 3 here was seen in Netherlands, and it was an engineering prototype, apparently. So Tesla was testing, was performing uh, performance charging testing on it. So we don't have any other details about what power levels you could get from CCS but you know um, these FastNet chargers are up to 175 kilowatts Um, so we do expect that Model 3s that do charge through CCS at these type of chargers will get in excess of 120 kilowatts but that's not confirmed. 120 is about what you get on a supercharger so uh, in theory you could get more from CCS than you could from supercharger which would be pretty unique for Model 3 or for Tesla owners specifically but in this case Model 3s. Uh, So we'll see and now Tesla is going to be retrofitting superchargers with CCS plugs as well over the next coming weeks and months uh, in anticipation of the Model 3 of course which uh, orders have opened in many Europe countries, European countries, and more are happening all the time. So good to see that Tesla's thought about some of the other infrastructure in here in a way to help owners uh, get uh, more charging uh, out of their Model 3. 
Last show, I talked about Volkswagen. Just to have a quick update about the idea. I spent a lot of time, so I won't to talk a lot about it today. But there was an article that came out that uh, the EV will deliver, of course, they're talking about 300 mile range, like a golf. Um, and that's interesting because we're hearing different, a little bit different numbers come out. The WLTP numbers are about 345 miles, but of course, we know we can't really use WLTP. Uh, TP. We need to really kind of look at the more North American or U.S. stringent EPA testing, which is around 290 miles or so. Um, now, some reports are coming out that the ID will cost, and I take it this is the entry level ID, will cost the same as about a modern Golf diesel uh, car, uh, which is around 19,000 to 25,000 pounds or 24 to 32,000 USD. Um, according to Top Gear, which uh, has some uh, uh, some input into this article, the lower end of the price range for the model with a smaller battery that offers about 206 miles of range. So it looks like VW is going to tier battery sizes and come up with different offerings at different price points. But even something with 200 mile range below 24,000 US is going to be a pretty strong candidate for mass adoption. Now remember, the Volkswagen IDs, as I mentioned before, are built on that MEB platform and they'll have battery pack ranges available from 48 kilowatt hours to 111 kilowatt hours. So pretty good, depending on which vehicle and uh, which options are available. Um, the first ID uh, that'll come out to be orderable, which is right now called the Neo, we don't have a full name on that yet. Um, It'll have, uh, it'll be able, you'll be able to order it like you can with a Tesla through an online ordering system. Some more specs about the ID, it'll top out at about 100 miles an hour because obviously you don't want to really go too much faster than that because if you've driven a battery electric vehicle on highway speeds and you've gone faster than you should be, you'll see your uh, range decrease awfully fast as uh, battery, EVs just don't like going really, really fast and batteries don't like that either. They deplete quite quickly. Um, and of course, the VW is going to include a liquid cooling uh, and uh, rated to charge up to 125 kilowatts uh, for these vehicles. So that's pretty good, allowing you to get, again, that 250 miles or so in about 30 minutes. And it, they'll also come equipped with an 11 kilowatt home charging options, which is much better than, the, you know, the 6.6 .6 in the Leaf and, and others like that, 7, 7 and, and others. So it seems that we're getting some more specs here on VW. I'll keep a close eye on this. And um, actually, I mentioned in the last show that I've got a trip coming up uh, next month, and I've actually confirmed it now. I'm going to be attending. Uh, I've got a press pass to attend the press event at the Detroit North American International Auto Show in mid-January. So I'm excited to be going to that and seeing what I can see from a new releases from auto. So I'm excited, and I'm hoping that VW will have a really good display there. And I'm really hoping that Nissan might have something to say about the 60 kilowatt hour leaf. So stay tuned for that. That episode should be exciting. And since it's the end of the year, I'll be getting some updates from some of the manufacturers that I'm following and talked about Unity in the last show. On this show, I got an email from Sono Motors. You guys may remember back in um, September, October, I can't remember now. The year's kind of a blur for me. It's been so busy. I was fortunate enough to be in, in Germany and uh, they were, Sono was doing a lot of press stuff around southern Germany. So I was able to go out there and review a car and talk to some folks. It was really cool to see their, their um, prototype um, vehicle. Well, they've uh, re sent me an email about some of the stuff that's happened this year. Um, they've got over 9,000 reservations now for their car. And um, it looks like, and they actually started in 2017 taking reservations and they had about 6,000. It really picked up in this year. They had a, almost 6,000 just a year alone. Um, they've done test drives where over 13,000 people have uh, driven it, myself included, even though it was around a closed loop track. Um, so in the year, it's been very productive for them getting a lot of feedback and input from people. And, and uh, of course, uh, all the, the uh, things they want to hear. Now, they've been working with uh, their contract manufacturers and they're going to announce a public uh, a partnership next year and this is going to be for their core manufacturer that's going to actually build the vehicles for them i talked about some of the sub manufacturers that they've partnered with for things like batteries and motors and stuff but this is uh, an announcement that they'll come up uh, probably in the i would say the first half of next year to talk about who's going to really help them build these vehicles from a manufacturing perspective and that's going to be interesting because that will help i guess determine further timelines as far as when they're actually going to get get their final production vehicle sorted out uh, i think what i I've seen is still a, a pre-production prototype what we've seen so far and uh, their plan is to have by the end of 2019 uh, the production of the Scion will start so good luck for them I hope they keep me um, informed of what's going on and I'll keep watching them as well and if you haven't checked them out just look for Sono Motors and uh, give them a look-see 
just some information that came out recently about uh, Rivian or Rivian. I have to figure out how to pronounce that. That's that. Uh, I talked about it on the audio podcast. This, uh, the guys that announced their pickup truck and SUV starting in the North American markets uh, in the next couple of years, which I think, as I've been saying uh, for the last couple of shows now, this is going to watch these guys. If uh, they go public, uh, buy some stock. I don't have any non-disclaimer, uh, but uh, uh, non-disclosure, I mean, but I don't have any stock or I have, I, I have to go check these guys out. But I think what they're what they've come to market with is bang on for the North American market specifically and others, of course, with their Rivian pickup truck and F and five to seven passenger SUV. Well, they've they've came out with some interesting about their battery pack design. Now, if you recall, um, they're going to be really they're going to have the biggest uh, consumer battery pack for a vehicle in the market today. I mean, Tesla kind of is up there right now with the 100 kilowatt hour version packs on their Model X cars. But uh, their Rivian is going to be offering packs up to 180 kilowatt hours. So these are gigantic packs. Of course, they have a bigger frame to work with and do that. Well, there was some interesting article about um, some of the battery pack information. And they are indeed 2170 double stack um, cells that they're using in this. And something unique that they've, I guess, watched what's going on is they're using something, uh, what they call a 7 millimeter flat cooling plate. And it's sandwiched between the two layers of cells. And I've got some pictures going up behind me here um, and if somebody's really technical they can comment back to me and what all this means but I, I what I get from the article is that this kind of solution the use of a cold plate between two battery cells so you got cells here cells here you got a cold plate that's going to be cooled somehow probably most likely liquid cooling um, and it's a single cooling that will chill both those layers at the same time so it reduces the amount of energy needed to power the cooling system um, thereby adding to range anytime you can use less battery less energy from the battery packs to run onboard systems like electronics like cooling all that kind of stuff the better you'll get for range obviously so this type of design apparently is going to give them a little bit of a boost in range and the cooling system designs allows for tighter packaging of cells within the modules um, now they're un they have a unique packaging model which will allow the module to be 25 percent denser than any other battery module on the market and that's pretty cool because as you know anybody that's been following the battery electric vehicle market knows that tesla kind of really leads in the density power ratio from a battery pack perspective and in their technology and it looks like rivian's come up with something that might even better what tesla's put together and give you more density within a similar type of framework uh, module framework so um it's pretty cool i mean they're um each module has 800 and it, according to this article it says 864 um, 2170 cells and there's 432 cells in each so you can do the math and uh, figure out how many actual cells are in each battery pack and then I guess the sizes are dependent um, they are using LG cells so that's been uh, determined and of course they have the same energy density as Tesla's uh, so I won't get into any more numbers because this article goes on and on and on with numbers but certainly definitely definitely check out the reference and I think it's just it's just cool that Rivian and that these startup companies and now this company again has kind of been in stealth mode for the last couple of years um, that they're they're they really watched the market and they've come up with some really cool engineering designs to just you know advance battery technology and as we know folks this technology is rapidly starting to increase in, in research, development, and companies that are looking to put money and, and develop new systems. So it's only going to get better, which is a great thing for all of us consumers that are looking to get uh, into the battery electric vehicle market. So keep your eye on Rivian. Rivian, and I really, really hope that they're at the Detroit Auto Show because I really want to jump around and check out these vehicles. I think these guys have a winning formula. Well, that's it I have for news articles. One thing I wanted to do before I close the show out is kind of just do my own perspective of, of 2018 year in review. Um, this is really the first year, I, you know, I started this channel back in April with Trevor, did a couple of shows and kind of took it over on my own shortly after. And, you know, being more a little bit more solo focused on this and, and, and I'll be having more time to actually dedicate to the show as I move forward now. Um, I'm really starting to learn a lot more of the EV industry, you know, uh, I thank people that think that I'm an expert. I wouldn't say that I'm an expert. I would say that I'm somewhat knowledgeable because I've been following the market now for a couple of years since Trev and I started the Model 3 show uh, two and a half or so plus years ago. So I've been a little bit more t in touch with the marketplace. I'm certainly not an expert, but um, I tr do try to look at what, what's going on from a global perspective and a consumer viewpoint, kind of map those things together. Well, I call 2018, and I know I've said this 
if if I had a nickel for every time I, I said it, I'd probably be doing all right. But I it really was the year of the hockey stick. And you'll know what I mean, that the EV adoption curve just kind of took off in that hockey stick style uh, from an adoption perspective, which is great. This was a year of massive growth for EV adoption globally, not just in certain countries, not just like Norway, where we know that they're going you know ballistic with this kind of adoption stuff. Uh, one of the, of course, the key elements for uh, EV adoption in 2018 was attributed, obviously, to the Tesla Model 3. It got finally uh, was delivering on mass, uh, especially at least in North America to start. Uh, other countries will come next year. And it's become the number one selling battery electric vehicle in North America. No surprise at all, as I've said many times. Tesla has a huge order backlog globally they need to fill, so they're going to crank these things out. Last count, they were around 7,000 a week now at production hitting. So good for them. There's a lot of Model 3s on the road, and now Europe's coming online, and other countries will come next year. It'll be all good for Tesla and the Model 3. So that's great. Uh, just wanted to reiterate again, my according to my numbers, uh, Nissan is still a distant second as far as the, um, you know, as far as EVs goes. Uh, and I'm talking about the new Nissan Leaf 2.0 has done very well, uh, even with, you know, rapid gate issues and people slamming Nissan for, for kind of keeping with an older design from a battery pack perspective. The car has sold relatively well, actually very well uh, by their standards. It, it's overachieved their numbers from year over year. And that's because I think it's still got a pretty strong value to price uh, proposition now be aware nissan you know the, the kona and the, and the nero ev um, and these kind of cars that are coming out in vw with the id they're going to give nissan a run for their money in the value prop so they're going to have to step it up and i hope they do it with the 60 but that's another story uh, but certainly even with those the concerns that some people have about Nissan. Remember, they're still the number one battery electric vehicle or oil electric vehicle manufacturer by sales. Uh, the, the Nissan Leaf is sorry by model for global sales in uh, year you know of all time. They have over three hundred fifty thousand, probably closer to three hundred sixty thousand cars sold. I haven't looked at the final year numbers yet. Um, and that's a pretty big number. Now Tesla's obviously passed them from a total. Uh, all electric car perspective, but that's if you add up the S, the X, and the Model 3 numbers. But Nissan, just with the one model with the Leaf, has, has is still the number one selling all uh, electric battery vehicle in the planet. So good for Nissan, and I hope they continue to innovate and to bring on uh, good products to be able to spur adoption. And I'll have more stuff about Nissan next year because I, I know that they've got a big electrification story that, they, that they're that they moving forward with, and I'm going to hear more stuff, hopefully in Detroit, if not certainly in the Toronto Auto Shows, about where they're going and their messaging around that. Now, many of course, not just Tesla and Nissan, but many other manufacturers were rolling out models as well for battery electric electric vehicles. Um, unfortunately, VW was one of the ones that was slowing things down. They cut production of the e-golf, you know, at least the shipments to North America, because uh, we reported a lot that it was really hard to find an e-golf. Uh, and sales really slowed to a crawl uh, this year for VW. So that's too bad. But obviously, with, as I mentioned earlier, with the ID announcements, I think they're really going to be able to get back on track if they can, you know, actually deliver something when they say they're going to deliver it and, and it meets the specs that they're talking about. And I think they'll be able to. So there's definitely hope for VW. Now, as I mentioned, this year marked uh, sales and, and people uh, and other manufacturers, excuse me, really getting to the battery electric vehicle marketplace, uh, launching and announcing uh, vehicles like Mercedes, Audi, Jaguar, uh, Porsche, and Honda, of course. Now, again, some of these have hit the streets. Some of these have been announcements and that are still coming. Uh, but it's good to see that all these manufacturers, in addition to what we're seeing from Tesla, from Nissan, from Hyundai, Kia, uh, GM, VW, and Smart. Uh, I mean, Ford, you could put throw Ford in there, but they haven't done much. And even GM now seems to be taking a step back, but they still got at least the Bolt product out there. So all that means is that there's there's more stuff coming. There's more choice coming for consumers, and that's what we want. We want, you know, whether it's high end, low end, all, all across the spectrum, we need the choices so that we can help to spur EV adoption and, and give you the choice that you need to fit your lifestyle and your use case. So it's good to see that a lot of these can out now i've said in a couple of shows that i think the the hyundai kona especially the kia nero ev are game changers because they, you know they're capitalizing on that smaller suv platform which is a hugely hugely popular um, a vehicle especially in north america and a lot of parts of europe um, for from that bought from that style and i think these are one of the uh, the kona and the uh, nero ev are really uh, one of the best, or they are going to be the, the best battery electric vehicles out in the market in that segment 
with features and value you know to get 64 kilowatt hour battery at the price point that they're talking about is phenomenal you start looking at incentives in certain areas and you're and it's, it's a super super value so good on them i think you know watch them in 2019 they're going to really ex if they can build enough i just like you keep saying that if they can just push enough through production and get them out there they will sell so we'll keep an eye on them now 2018 was also a unique year for um, you know, getting awareness of electrification and specifically for an event called Fully Charged Live. And I, of course, did a show about that because I went out there last June or June of this year to cover it. It was the first of its kind of event. It was showcasing EVs only. So it wasn't just a car show. It was an electric vehicle specific show that had cars and vehicles and, you know, things like even scooters and stuff there, but uh, supporting ecosystem products and, and services around the electrification of automobiles. And that was a great show, you know, the, the uh, Robert and, and Johnny and the Dan and the team who put this thing together for Holy Charge were, were really not sure what they were going to get, you know, and they, they, the attendance was mind blowing for them for a first round. And the great thing about that show is that the majority of people who came out were not EV owners. And that's the kind of audience that we'd like to see. Um, so it was great that this show came out and it was so positive for them that there's two events coming up for 2019. Fully Charged Live 2.0 has already been announced for the June time from the U.S. UK, and there'll be a USA show as well. I can't say where and when because it's not public knowledge yet. But as soon as I, I get the green light, I will I will give you all the details on an upcoming show. So stay tuned for that. But exciting times for these kind of events. Now, also, there was a year of dramatic increase in charging infrastructures. I mean, almost every show that I uh, talked about and had on, I, I had an article about somebody increasing charging environments and infrastructures. If it wasn't Tesla, it was others. And that's great because, you know, we need more infrastructure to support the adoption, not only because there's going to be more vehicles on the road looking to take longer trips and looking to plug in into a fast charging environments, but also just, you know, to give pe people peace of mind and comfort that they can go from A to B and have something there to get them through. You know, it's good to see that more and more vendors are coming up. I talked about companies, even startups like eCamion, who have been doing some stuff, who are going to build some dedicated cross Canada networks. So it's all good to see that. And it's not just uh, supercharging as well. We're seeing a vast um, uh, scaling of CCS and Chatamo. So Chatamo is not going anywhere, folks. I know some people beat up on Chatamo, poor Chatamo standard. It's here to stay. They've already developed new standards with higher uh, charging rates. So it's not going anywhere. It's going to continue to go for quite some time. Uh, but again, it's good. It just gives multiple choice for people. Really great to see an increase in charging infrastructure. Now, on a less positive note for 2018, there were some instances where it was a year that we've actually seen some EV incentives come to an end. So, of course, Tesla hit the clip level for the threshold for the U.S. federal tax credit. Um, so, you know, uh, organizations or, or sorry, people who have not were not able to jump on that kind of missed the boat there. But I mean, it's a good sign because their sales are up and they've, they've reached those thresholds. But obviously some incentives are gone. Now here in Canada, specifically in Ontario, we had a change of government uh, in the summer time frame and they eliminated all EV incentives. Now there's talk about the federals and now the province is circling back and there may be stuff coming in the future. But for right now, there's zero. There's no incentives for electric vehicles here in Ontario. Uh, anything to do with electric vehicles or the ecosystem products. So, um, you know, that's too bad. That's a sad note. Out. However, I do want to say a positive that even with those EV incentives going away in Ontario, I haven't really seen the early numbers suggest that EV sales continue to be strong in Ontario. They might be slightly down, but they're still strong, especially when you look at year over year numbers. And that's what counts. We're you know, seeing that hockey stick, that adoption growth. So um, good good to, to see that people aren't really dissuade so much by the EV incentives going away and they still believe in electrification. Now, I talked about EV startup like Sono uh, Motors earlier. Well, that was this was a year of really a lot of startups coming out to uh, coming out of, into the limelight, basically, or or really starting to garner some press and get some momentum behind what they're coming to market with. So obviously, Sono Motors, Unity, and most recently Rivian. But again, and there's probably other companies that I haven't uh, mentioned as well. A couple that I've covered, but a lot more startups. So got you know people that have ideas that want to do something a little differently or make it urban or car sharing or whatever. It's all all good you know every time we get a tailpipe off the road it's good for our environment now, battery prices continue to fall in 2018, so that's helping spur adoption because it, it, we see a slight lowering of costs in some instances. Uh, we haven't hit that magical $100 USD per kilowatt pack pricing yet, but we're certainly getting closer. And uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, 
with innovation and with more R and D and more technologies, more manufacturers coming to light, that's going to continue to drive costs down. And finally, we close out this year with a reality check that I did on the last show about the world's climate change progress um, at, that was announced after the the, uh, the, the summit in Poland there. Um, you know, it, the good thing that came out of that summit is that there's a strong recommitment by most major countries to do better at reducing greenhouse gas emissions with a positive outcome. And I really hope that they, they stick to this. Um, as I mentioned a couple of sh few shows ago when I talked about greenhouse gas a while back, emissions, we're nowhere near where we need to be as an overall planet. And, and most countries are way behind the targets that, that were set earlier, that were agreed upon. So it looks like this conference has re-energized that whole effort. Um, now there's, there's things we're hearing in Canada here about, uh, about uh, augmenting the plans that are in place to kind of increase what we need to do. And, so, and other countries are looking to do the same. So that's great. Definitely a positive outcome. Uh, let's keep an eye on that, though, and see how we're doing for next year. And last but not least, 2018 was an interesting year for me personally because I finally got a all electric battery vehicle, my first EV ever, my 2018 Nissan Leaf. So it was pretty fun for me and I learned a lot about the EV marketplace and, and EV ownership operations of EV that has been driving my Leaf around now for uh, seven or eight months or so now. I will do a one year review uh, sometime in the early spring. So stay tuned for that for next year. I didn't really want to do a six month and then a year. I'll just wait for a year. I want to go through the winter and see how it kind of works. We really haven't had challenging winter weather yet. We've had a cold spell, but not really a lot of snow. Got my snow tires on. I'm all ready for the winter, so I really need to see how this thing handles in the snow. And then by next, uh, or by next early spring, I'll be able to do a one-year review and give you my thoughts. But it was an interesting year for me as I was able to actually get get into EV ownership myself. Looking forward to 2019, it does look like it's going to be a great year to continue the forward momentum that we've seen in EV adoption at an unprecedented pace to keep up with that hockey stick approach. And I eagerly await more choice for consumers, continued growth in charging infrastructures, and EV costs continuing to slowly come down. There's talk about you know achieving cost parity in three to five years. It might be five to seven years. It's hard to say right now. But you know the more product, the more competition, the more stuff that's out there, the better it is for us consumers because it is going to drive costs down and pricing down. We're not there yet, but we're slowly getting there. Well, that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution Show, episode 23. Now, before I close off, just want to remind you about the uh, charity fundraiser that I've got going for a Model 3 trunk set or frunk set, actually. Uh, and I detailed that on the last show. Also, I'm including a very rare limited um, EV Revolution Show coffee mug. Now the green is showing transparent because I've got green screen, so it's looking kind of wanky, but there's a green logo and the hat as well. It's got the green logo with some wording on the back, the uh, EV Revolution ball cap. So I'm going to include that in there. Uh, I want to thank uh, the 30 or so plus people that have already bought tickets. That's fantastic. We're off to a great start. We've got another a week or a week and a half or so that I'm running this, so uh, till the end of the year. So if you haven't checked it out, please do. Um, I just met up with Trevor earlier today, and we did a quick review of, he's got a Model X set uh, from the same manufacturer, Oscar and Hamish, and uh, we talked about, we actually reviewed the Model 3 set, and he reviewed the Model X, so it's going to be on his channel coming up probably early next week, so check that out. But again, check out the Eventbrite. I have the link in the show notes. Um, go check it out if you're interested in buying a ticket for that. I will draw a winner in early January and then ship that to wherever that winner is in the world. And on that note, thank you very much for tuning into the EV Revolution show and to listening and watching me. I very, very, very much appreciate it. Of course, if you have comments, you want to email me suggestions, you want to email me a video of your vehicle or your thoughts or stuff that you want to talk about or, or an audio file, send it to me. I'll put it on the show. You can reach me at evrevolutionshow at gmail.com. Twitter, follow me at, at evrevshow is my Twitter handle. I uh, appreciate a lot of people that follow me and that comment through that as well. I, I certainly love to see that. You're watching this on YouTube, so hopefully you've subscribed. If not, please do. That would be much appreciated. As uh, I mentioned in the last show, I'm trying to hopefully to get to 10,000 subscribers for by the end of next year. It's kind of my goal. We'll see what happens. And don't forget, you can click that bell if you have subscribed, so you'll get automatically notified of new shows. Uh, I still do the audio podcasts, of course, and you can find those uh, EV Revolution Show audio podcasts. Pretty easy for naming conventions find it on uh, through uh, itunes on your favorite podcast player 
You can find it on Google Play, on uh, Stitcher, on Spotify, and TuneIn Radio. So there's multiple sources to find this. And of course, also, uh, as I sh say every show, and then I have the credits at the end, I want to thank my Patreon supporters for um, including me in your patronage and, and uh, having the confidence to send me a couple of bucks, whatever that is, every month so that I can continue doing what I'm doing here through the shows and the audio podcast. So thank you very much as a heartfelt. And on that note, I'd like to take this opportunity to wish everybody a very Merry Christmas or the very best for the Christmas season in whatever way you celebrate Christmas. Uh, even if you don't, all the best thoughts and, and prayers out there for everybody to have really a good time. Spend time with family. Um, just relax. Uh, you know, Put the, the world on pause for a second. Just focus on what's important in your lives, folks. And thank you, everybody, that's, um, you know, purchased an EV or talk to people and maybe help to make some decisions about EV ownership for other folks because you are making change in this world. It's slow, but it, you know that the, that's the power that we have is that we can affect change by doing what we're doing. So thank you very much for that. All the best for Merry Christmas. Hope you like the ugly Christmas sweater episode here of the EV Revolution Show. And until next time, take care and we'll see you then.